So today we're going to talk about Android and more explicitly about the debugging protocol that's being used to help various developers into just debugging their apps faster and how it became weaponized by the bad guys. So first thing first, let's find a bit more about you guys. Who uses an Android device? All right, we present. Who's a, an Android developer around here? Or not only developer, just maybe you just compiled an Android Studio project at some point in your life. Nice, nice. So all of the stuff that is being pushed to your phone is being pushed through the Android, through the USB cable. And somehow along those lines, um, the um, Google added a new feature in which you could expose that said protocol, USB protocol, over the network. But a lot of the details somehow got lost into translation, and this is going to be the focus for today's talk. Uh, a bit more about me. Um, I recently joined the cybersecurity field a few years ago. I did my big stunt by hacking, doing some simple MIFIR hack on the public transportation system in Bucharest, which, on which I did a responsible disclosure and got PR karma. And after I discovered that I couldn't travel freely around Bucharest, I decided to basically hack my car. And this led to some interesting discoveries about the amount of information that your car knows about you. In my case, it knew a lot more about me than I knew myself about my phone. But you can just Google that up. Uh, the presentation is somewhere on the internet. Uh, follow me on GitHub for all of the code and all of the stuff that I'm going to show you, and on Twitter for the latest memes that I'm going to post. So how, why did I start working on this? I mean, I didn't just wake up one day and decided to, hey, I'm going to write an ADB honeypot. It's going to be awesome. The root cause was basically the advent of everything that's smart nowadays, and most explicitly, the reuse of motherboards into modern IoT devices. Now you've got smart TVs, smart fridges, smart toasters, smart cars that actually use PCBs, motherboards, that were used for other Android devices, and actually, some of them actually run Android. And who knows, maybe in the future we're going to have like even smarter toasters, or I don't know. Who around you watches Battlestar Galactica around here? All right. So for whoever doesn't know, in the future they did the right thing. They basically banned all IoT devices, so you no longer had any kind of network communication between devices, at least in military applications. But more on that later. While browsing the internet, I also found out that I, was the only, I wasn't the only one worried about the dangers of unprotected IoT devices. This is a really cool piece from Kevin Bemont, um, in which he explains the advent of some new kind of malware that is being pushed on Android port 5555. Does it ring any bell to you guys? All right, so Android, as I mentioned earlier, has this really simple protocol, or what used to be a really simple protocol, that worked over either USB or TCP, and from what some really clever guys told me, it was designed just to be as a simple stream multiplexer, and that was that. However, over the years, more and more and more stuff got added. And this somehow complicated things, but I thought, how hard can it be? I will just read the RFCs and it will work. Well, it didn't. It just didn't work. I didn't know why. So maybe the problem was that there was no vulnerability. Maybe everything was fine. 
So I started digging a bit more. And it was. This is an IP that you could find just by going around Shodan and connect to it, do some uh, random Android shell stuff, and it was already infected by malware. Another malware, and another one that was running on the same device. So these are not three separate devices, they are only one. And somehow the bad guys didn't hit the same problems when they were trying to do the attacking. I was having problems when I was trying to do the whole tricking them into connecting to me part, so I was missing something. But anyway, even if I develop it, I mean, how bad would it be? Because they secured Android, right? They added an authentication method in Android 4.2.2, I think. And at least over USB, you could not connect unless the, you would approve the pop-up on the screen of your phone. Well, this is Android 5, and I could connect to it, and I didn't get any kind of pop-up. So something was amiss there. And if you're coming from a white, ops, white hat hacker perspective, you'd want to hang yourself with that, but for a black hat, that's a lot of sausage to eat, you know. It can get you a long time. Um, and while digging around to identify any more potential targets, I found something that actually frightened me. There is a five-star general somewhere in, tai in Taiwan that actually wanted, I guess, a smart TV or something like that, and he just plugged it into the internet, and you could actually connect to it and do a lot of bad stuff over there. Unfortunately, right now it's down. It's no longer publicly accessible, so kudos to that. But this got me an idea. This got me started. What if I actually put all of the work, even though there are no RFCs, no documentation whatsoever, and try to sneak in some of my honeypots and intercept the traffic that would be coming, the attacks that would be launched, sprayed around the internet. So I started digging around. I mean, there is no substitution for hard work. You just have to do it and you just have to hammer it until you get it right. And my target was simple. I wanted to be able to connect to the device I wanted to push a binary to it, and I wanted to launch some shell commands against my fake device, against my honeypot. So I started reading. There's pretty extensive documentation when it comes to the ADB protocol, but unfortunately, it's a bit outdated. Remember, initially, it wasn't designed to do all of the stuff that's doing nowadays. So somehow, a lot of the more advanced features got bolted on, and don't worry, I'm going to open source all of this, so it's okay. Um, fortunately, the community jumped in, and they started doing their own research. They started doing their own reverse engineering of the protocol, trying to understand how it works, trying to see where other guys have failed. And somehow, the knowledge was there, but it still needed some processing in order to get something out of it. You can find some really smart guys who have already written these awesome wrappers for an ADB packet. Although a bit incomplete, it just makes everything work. So this is the structure. If you have a command, two arguments the data, the length of the data that you're, you, you're going to send, CRC, and some magic. And the commands aren't that complex. It's just a sync, uh, connect, authenticate, open, OK, close, write. Like, pretty simple stuff, right? And whenever you, for example, if you want to do an ADB shell on that device, everything that is happening that you're going to see in a traffic capture is this part. This is happening between the ADB client and the server that's running locally, and this is going to the phone. So you've basically got an open command, 
and a response to that, and then you've got a write with all of the response and all of the contents of the uh, list command. Unfortunately, this was also obsolete, so it still needed a bit more digging. And what I found out is that the CRC isn't something standard that you would find. It's some kind of stuff they implemented. Uh, nobody explained why you would have this magic put there. If any of you knows, contact me. As I've said, I'm really new in the industry. So uh, right now, the best way that I can explain stuff like that is just aliens. That's it. No more, no less. It's just black magic to me. But that didn't stop me from getting it working, because what I did, I replaced all of the knowledge with just hard work. I did three traffic captures for three instances when I would be sending a list command to that device, and the send command in this specific example. And based on the network connectivity that I was experiencing at that time, I would get different responses. So what I did, I just took a pen and a piece of paper, starting writing down the order in which the packets would get sent, and I would try to emulate all of that. So I put them in a nice format with all of the edge cases that were around there. And as you can see, the length of the communication from, uh, for sending a file can range from just exchanging three packets to some really, really complex stuff that's going on there. Because aliens, I don't know why, it's just corner case after corner case after corner case. Fortunately, I got all of that covered. I had a bit of help from this awesome dude who uh, gave me uh, all of his work into implementing a simple uh, ADB client. So I took all of the header and packet building part and I used it to recreate a server, basically. And after a lot of work, of a lot of just endless nights and fights with my girlfriend, I finally made it. It worked. I could send files, I could send shell commands, and most importantly, it wasn't only me who was connecting to my fake device, it was also a lot of bad guys. And we're gonna talk about that first, uh, after I show you this. You can connect at any time to one of my publicly exposed honeypots and test it right now. If you want to say hi, just uh, drop your payload right there. You're gonna have a really cool uh, entourage to hang out with. And let's take a look into all kinds of worms that started hitting my honeypot. Keep in mind, this is a residential uh, not residential, but a data center IP that I used to host the honeypot from which I did most of my analysis. So it's grossly incomplete. It doesn't account for the fact that there are maybe vulnerable devices behind the net of major telecom providers throughout the world. And I'm gonna talk about that a bit later. So. The first guy that started hitting my honeypot was somebody who looked like he would be killing all of the other bad processes. These are all miners, miners. A lot of mining going on. So he basically shut down everything so you would have a clean device, right? No. Uh, he also pushed, pushed his own miner after that, and starting mining on a clean device, basically. Um, the most proficient actor that I found, and that is still highly active right now on the internet, 
is Trinity. And I've actually written a blog post about this. You can go look it up. It goes into great details on how Trinity works. But what Trinity is, um, it's basically a worm that first connects to your device. It checks if the miner is installed. If it's not installed, it pushes the APK to the device. And then it launches it. And after that, it also checks if the wormable part of the worm, of the malware, is present as well, which is uh, Trinity, the Trinity process, this one. So after doing a bit of binary analysis, I discovered that uh, Trinity was actually scanning all of the internet and pushing itself and the mining binary to any target that it found to have this 5555 port open. And it was mining through uh, a web view that was loading a simple HTML file that had a coin hive script, just like old times. And inside the binary, you could see how it was trying to create a random IP and send all of the commands that I've shown you earlier to the vulnerable device. But looking back at the first guy, he was actually shutting down around seven other, act other actors. So I thought, man, there must be a lot more, and there was. Meet FPOT, uh, a blockchain malware, because blockchain is uh, the buzzword right now, even in the malware community. Um, the guys at 360 did a really cool job in analyzing it. And it didn't do anything malicious, per se. It was only mining. So I guess it was like a um, victimless crime. If you think that your phone blowing up doesn't make any victims. And a really cool journalist, Catalin Chimpano, wrote a piece about Trinity and FBOT actually fighting over the ownership of these devices. Keep in mind that when I initially started doing the research, there were, were about 70,000 devices or so. And at the end, the number dropped to about 10,000. So kind of their fair share of the whole pie shrunk, as the share of the pie shrunk down, they would be more and more desperate to shut themselves down. Especially when you look at more and more guys that were trying to push their own malware onto those devices. So this guy was trying to bypass any firewall by just doing some encoding uh, of the payload. And you can see it here, but right here it's basically launching what all of this, which is the first stage downloader that would drop another binary that would start mining on your own device. Um, I might say that the variety when it came to building malware and naming malware and the targets that that malware was targeting was quite diverse. For example, we had something called Putin's helper. No, not this guy. Um, which was targeting DVR devices. So at some point, somebody discovered that a lot of DVRs had the port open and were basically running Android. So he had this great idea of making money and mining off them. And the devices are still out in the open, left exposed and vulnerable, thanks to the great fragmentation of IoT. So, what can we do? One of the funniest guys that I found was the apologetic miner. He said he's sorry, but he's mining on my device, not because he wants, but because he needed the cash. He's truly sorry, but currently he can't find any job, so he has to resort to his black hat 
way in order to survive. He even left his uh, email here, so you can uh, drop him an email and he'll send you his CV back. He even promised to whitelist the device if you send the email and he will stop attacking you because you are uh, worthy in his view. But instead of actually targeting them down and asking them, hey guy, can you please stop mining on my device? I actually decided to open source my honeypot and engage other researchers because, to be honest, being so young in the industry, um, the community has given me a lot, so I decided to give back. And shortly after, the number of vulnerable devices dropped by 75%, at least, mainly because people were actually running that and actually submitting abuse reports to the authorities, and I found that exhilarating. I mean, they were using my product that was based on some other guy's research, and journalists made in a completely different country to shut down malware from all around the world. And if we look at it a bit more, we can see that the number of IPs has dropped, but I don't know if you guys know statistics, but when a graph is like this, that's not good, especially in this case. So what happened here? So I decided to dig about around a bit more, and I found two anomalies. Can we spot the first one? The first one is here. So more IPs and more binary downloads. And I started look, what the hell happened? I mean, it was weird. The second one was right here but the number of binary downloads dropped and the number of IPs dropped as well. And I started digging around a little bit more because I couldn't find any conclusive information from this peak. But this guy was using server to just spray the internet with connection attempts and just pushing his binaries to Android devices, one after the other, one after the other, trying to get as many of them um, into his uh, web. Uh, unfortunately for him, uh, he got a lot of abuse reports and he just got shut down. Hence, the drop in the activity. So, this is bad, this is good. Um, <clears throat> and another really cool side effect of just releasing a product is that people have actually started creating memes. This wasn't done by me, this was done some by some other guys on Twitter that actually took the honeypot and started sending abuse requests, starting doing research on what's happening, and hopefully somebody who actually works inside a factory somewhere in China saw my report and said, hey guys, maybe we shouldn't build our firmware with the development port open from the factory and, you know, shut it down after we're done with the QA process. Um, I've got a big list of bugs for my honeypot, and that's good because I didn't submit them. Somebody else did, which meant that this was getting usage. Uh, some other dude integrated it into Teapot, and now it's being employed as the ADB honeypot solution at some telecom companies, which is really cool. Um, and I don't know, short story short, I haven't been doing this for quite a while. Um, I'm here just to show you that if you set your mind onto something, and if you work towards it and share it with the community, you're gonna make the world a better place. Because in the end, as you can see, the number of attacks dropped. And this basically made the internet a safer place. Because I was actually seeing complaints on forums about people saying that, uh, man, I just bought a $3,000 $3, TV and 
it's not working. It's moving really slow ever since yesterday and don't know what I can do with it. You won't find any more, any of, any more complaints like that on the internet anymore because there's awareness about this, there's awareness at the ISP level, and I don't know. Even if it was really hard in just building this, in the end, we saved some guys from the pain of having to factory return the TV so they won't have any malware, but uh, just enjoy it. So thank you. And if you have any questions, we still have some time. If not, I'm going to give you back 15 minutes of your time. <laughs>